Corey, Jim, and I were just talking about it. This game needs to be given some kind of mantra like the underrated bowl or something out there. People, wake up to this one. This is going to be huge in regards to the Big Ten circles. Indiana and Iowa meeting a tremendous conference game, of course, uh, with these two schools getting it on at Iowa City. We got Corey Brada on the line, joins us on a regular basis, of course, and is our stalwart there over at the Iowa Channel. So if you love Big Ten football, the Hawkeyes, or just want to follow one of the uh, top programs in the Big Ten, join us on our Iowa Channel. And, uh, of course, Corey's got it locked down there at uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Also joined on the Indiana side from Jim Coyle from uh, uh, Indiana Sports Beat Radio. And also Jim is the publisher and founder of Rivals on Indiana Football and Athletics. Gentlemen, appreciate you joining us tonight. Happy to be here, man. Happy to be here. Happy for football to be back. I was just remember being out and watching uh, it was the Il Illinois game. I was looking forward to seeing it, but just I, I remember seeing the first moments of that game. It was like, ah! it was a moment. Uh, and I was like, man, it was just to see the motion, but everything came right back. You're like, get out of bounds, do this, do that. Uh, and it's funny how things just come right back. Well, Jim, this is not the NBA where uh, the season's over and then you wait like three weeks for training camp to start. You know, we have to we have the longest off season in sports in college football. So these games are precious. There's only 12 of them. Absolutely, man. And they are getting more and more precious. Uh, as we saw last year, what happened, uh, we almost lost them. But uh, this year we get back and and then now we don't know what the future is going to be. There's all so many other things to think about and talk about. But this season is looking to be, at least in the Big Ten, uh, pretty daggone incredible. Uh, and I think uh, it's going to be pretty daggone good across college football. Uh, Corey, of course, again, great to see you as well. Um, Jim, you being the more recent guest, uh, Corey, people are getting used to seeing him all the time. We'll start with you, Jim. Uh, everybody's asking about Michael Penix as to whether he is just at full strength, ready to go. How does he look right now? When I, when I spoke to him at Big Ten Media Days, and that's been uh, six weeks ago now, he has a whole new frame on him and you can see this v cut you can see a, a physicality to him that he didn't have before and not that that means you can't get injured because we've seen it happen we saw it happen to teddy bridgewater the ted will always say the teddy bridgewater injury it sometimes freak things happen but he has put on a substantial amount of muscle and you can see it uh you can see it when he walks but the confidence that they had all of them uh, up in Indianapolis. It, it was palpable. And so, I, I mean, this this entire team, I was thinking about, this is the fifth year for Tom Allen. So these are all Tom Allen guys. So these guys are Tom Allen to the core, all of them. And then even add the transfers, they're Tom Allen to the core now. But, but you've got five years of Tom Allen's culture uh, that is now taking, taking hold with these players. Corey, uh, these last couple of weeks of uh, Iowa camp, what has stood out to you? And of course, I want to direct everyone to Corey's uh, live stream that he produced uh, this past Saturday. Tremendous couple hours um, right there. But uh, what what have been the the storylines most recently with the Hawkeyes as they prepare for this huge opener? That's a good question, Mark. I, I think depth is the biggest, and that's that's kind of the discussion uh, that I had with Don on Saturday or on Sunday. In that live stream, Don Patterson, former Iowa assistant coach under Hayden Fry. Um, I think depth everywhere is kind of the big question. And certainly having a spring this year helped things. I think for a team like Iowa developmental program, um, last year hurt. Um, and so I, I was, I think fans, when they saw the 0 2 start last year and, you know, people looking at that like I was derailing, I, Ferentz kept it together. And so now you take that next step forward. Can you develop guys? I've heard good things about Luke Lachey at tight end. <laughs> Um, they need depth there. Uh, Sam Laporta is probably a future NFL tight end as typically every Iowa starter is, but they need depth. Uh, they need depth at tight end. They need depth at linebacker. Um, they need depth in the offensive line. They did, uh, produced a show or a video today on the Iowa channel. Kyler shot. Iowa's starting left guard is out. Uh, he was bailing hay and, uh, hurt his foot. So kind of an Iowa like injury there, but, uh, 
they, they're in, obviously everybody knows the offensive line is crucial to Iowa's success. So, um, as I said with Don on, on Sunday and, and people can call me a Homer all they want. I'm predicting that Iowa wins the West. Um, and, and again, I, I have not predicted anybody who's followed me in our podcast over the years. I do not predict that every year in case people are wondering. Um, I think Iowa has the makeup of a championship team. The one thing that can derail a team like Iowa and can derail probably any team, especially the, the Wisconsin like, or probably even Indiana for that matter is injuries. Um, Iowa loses its starting tight end. Iowa loses its starting tackle. It just changes everything. So um, the good news out of Iowa for camp is the Kyler shot injury is the one significant injury that I've heard about. Um, I think Kirk Ferentz, if, if there are more injuries, he's done an excellent job keeping those on the down low. Um, but if that's the case, if that's the one significant injury, then I think we're, we're looking at a really, really high, I think we're looking at a high quality game this Saturday either way, but I think Iowa has an excellent chance to get it done on Saturday. Jim, before we continue to really dive deep into the nuts and bolts of these two football teams, I want to broaden the scope just a little bit about the program there at IU and I'm going to liken Tom Allen to another personality in the conference because people bring up P.J. Fleck and it's often thought, OK, trying to determine, OK, is this guy really is, is that the real P.J. Fleck or is he a salesman? Is he authentic? And with Tom Allen, I don't think that's the question, but he's just this personality and just this bundle of energy. What is it about him that makes him the guy that he is, the guy that has turned around this program, the guy that gives these players hope that they can do really big things in this conference? Well, the number one thing is that he is completely sincere, and I'm saying that from a media standpoint, and that's just being around him enough, uh, a lot, where what you see is what you get all the time, 24-7. It doesn't matter what scenario it is, and he is true to his – word what he tells these kids um they know that he's going to be there i i think he's going to be at indiana for a long time but who, who knows i mean someone could come in and if he does something crazy crazy things happen but uh barring that i think he's going to be at indiana and that is continuity he's building something and it is he's doing it he's not doing it in an easy place he's not i don't want to crack on the acc but it, right now they're way down. So if you were building up something there, it, it would be easier. He's not, he's building it in like the toughest place you could possibly do it. Uh, the big 10 East and how he's done it. It's just, it's a head shaker because Indiana hired the Cam Camerons. They hired the Jerry Donardos. Uh, they ha you know hired the names and all that, and it didn't work. Uh, and the guy that had no head coaching experience whatsoever has come in and transformed a program that has done really besides bill mallory that they had some success there but for 50 years it's just been a dormant program and it, it's just it's it's just been so fun to watch and just to follow up on that um uh, it is been the butt of jokes around the big 10 not just for the product on the field but the lack of uh fan base uh, interest and deservingly so it's there's I, there's still no I, I don't think there's a an excuse for that um it just isn't uh it should not have taken this long uh to fix a, a program my gosh i mean I, I i know i'm not saying it's easy but man every program in the big 10 has had their ups including northwestern where can there be a harder place to do it than northwestern i mean man they've been to the rose bowl uh, so yeah, I just, I, I don't, I don't let in, I don't let Indiana off easy, but there it's all positive now. So it's going in a, in a direction that I don't know that anybody would have predicted five years ago. Other Jim, than Tom, I would, I would, I would challenge you on, on, uh, is it harder anywhere else? I think Vanderbilt fans may, may uh, have oh, something yeah. to say about that, but yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. I with... Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Corey, no, before no we, but, but... Uh, before we let you cut loose and, and you guys can go back and forth and, and this show will probably do best if I kick back and just listen to you two uh, really dive deep with the Hawkeyes and the Hoosiers. But um, you had made a statement before we came on, just uh, your 
perception of how this game's being perceived or not being perceived or put on the national stage or even the conference stage that it deserves. Mark, what's Iowa ranked coming into this game? I think they're 18. 18, correct. And Indiana is 17. 17. And so and I, I, I still saw, think that Iowa has more respect, has way more respect than Indiana, even though they're higher ranked. Well, as Jim, we got to stick. That sounds. We got to stick together on this. I watched the Fox broadcast on Saturday morning, and I don't think they mentioned this game once. They were previewing all these Week One games, um, Ohio State, Minnesota. I mean, you can go down the list, and not one mention. It, and if I'm wrong, I hope somebody can comment on here. But I didn't hear this game mentioned one time. And I think all of us as Hawkeye fans were watching that game because it's Big Ten West team. So. That kind of, uh, I'm sure that didn't sit well with uh, with Iowa fans or Indiana fans for that matter. Um, you know, I, I kind of go back to what you brought up initially, Mark, with with Michael Penix. I think that's kind of what Iowa fans, uh, you know, we don't wish anything. Uh, Iowa fans don't wish anything bad on on Hoosier that's players a, or on any opponent. I understand players. that's a hard thing to. Yeah, I, I get that. That is a but, hard but ground to tread. Yeah. But I think in the back of everybody's minds, they're hoping, hey, maybe he won't be ready until week two. I mean, I think Iowa fans, there's no question they take Indiana seriously. And there's no I, – I mean, unless Jim knows something I don't, there's no – there is no rivalry between Iowa and Indiana anywhere. There, there's – this is a – They're a very of, self-respected, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of respect, I think, between these two programs. Um, and, you know, I, I think Kirk has uh, – if he wasn't humble, I think he's a humble guy. Again, I'm a homer, I guess, in that regard. I think if, if he wasn't humble before last year, he is now, and I'm sure he – I know he really respects what Tom Allen's doing. I think Iowa fans respect what Tom Allen's doing. I mean, that Indiana program, I'll just uh, say this, during a COVID year to make the advancements they were able to make last year um, with a tough schedule. I mean, you're playing in the one of the toughest conferences in America. Um, I think if Michigan and Penn State didn't have a, a bad year, I could say this uh, more outwardly. But I think besides the SEC West, Maybe the toughest division in college football, Mark. You may say the SEC East is up there, but but you're a Buckeye fan. So uh, what they did last year was spectacular. And um, no, Iowa fans are taking this team seriously. Um, and I, I think it's split right now as far as uh, obviously the, the I think Iowa's got the line right now last time I checked. But I think uh, I could easily see Indiana win this game if, if Iowa has one or two uh, turnovers or at the wrong time or, you know, it, this is going to be a toss up in my mind. Oh, I think it's going to be a close game, no doubt. But I don't know that it's going that Indiana is going to require turnovers. Although they have built um, their their part of their foundation is built off of that. I mean, uh, how many uh, night? I uh, think total turnovers last year was like nineteen. It was crazy. Uh, interceptions, something like sixteen, uh, and that was in a shortened season. That was they went way over uh, the previous record, uh, and and that secondary is back. Uh, and I think the de this defense is actually much stronger because you've added some pieces uh, to that that front. Uh, you've added a new coordinator, uh, Norm Charlton, and they've added just a, they've done some tweaking and just added some people. And this this and some of these people are returning as they're all Americans. Uh, you've just th this is a stronger team, a faster team. Um, and uh, they are pretty solid on defense, and they have depth. That is something that this team has, or this program has never had, period, on either side of the ball, but they're, they've got the depth on defense. They've got some interchangeable parts in there, um, and these guys are just – hungry and they they still have a chip on their shoulder and it's a, that's that's that Tom Allen in them and it's that's it's fun to watch and I can't wait to watch I mean this thinking of starting the season with a game like this I'm like man no offense but I'm glad it's not you know western Kentucky uh or you know whatever because it just this is like boom right out of the box let it that's ding ding it's like nod your head and let the bull out you know, may, maybe I shouldn't feel this way, Jim, but uh, at least from a general consensus of what I've heard from Iowa fans, I think Iowa fans kind of feel the opposite. So maybe this is a, a bad, uh, bad sign for Hawk fans because I think Iowa fans, I think to the 0 2 start last year didn't help uh, when you start conference play that early and you lose to Purdue and you lose to Northwestern, you blow a 17 and nothing lead. I think Iowa fans would much rather start with, you know, a South Dakota State or a Kent State. So maybe that's an insult to us as, as Iowa people. 
Um, but uh, maybe that shows a little bit of a difference in, in mindset. I think uh, Tom Allen's gotten it done again. Uh, I think it seems like line play has improved immensely. We've seen from Maryland in past years that just because you've got skill position talent, tremendous skill position talent, I mean, you're going to be consistent and be able to win games consistently, especially in the big 10 conference. Um, but you, you mentioned Jim at the beginning of that, that uh, uh, topic, the defensive backs for, for Indiana. And I, I think that is my biggest position to watch on both sides, because you look at Indiana and I've had a lot of Indiana fans say, I think we had some on our broadcast Sunday. Can I throw the ball downfield against IU's defensive backs, not only because of the talent in the secondary that Tom Allen brings to the table, but also the struggles of, of Spencer Petrus at quarterback last year, especially early on. He hasn't played. Here's a kid who hasn't played in front of a crowd home or away. So is he going to be able to throw the ball downfield? And then on the opposite end of things, uh, you know, Iowa's defensive backs are probably as strong, I think, collectively as they've been, at least in, in recent memory for me. Um, you know, Iowa's kind of become, with Phil Parker being a former defensive backs coach and and obviously the, the defensive coordinator now, they've kind of gained this reputation for just pumping out cornerbacks, kind of like they pump out offensive linemen and tight ends. I think a lot of people from the outside don't realize that usually it's one or it's one all American or one first team, all, you know, first all, all big 10 t- uh, type player a year. And now they've got two. I mean, I think of Desmond King. I think of Josh Jackson, Michael Ojemudia. Those guys were basically playing on an Island uh, each of their best seasons. And now you have Riley Moss and Matt Hankins, Hankins ops to come back for an extra year. Um, I think it's going to be tough for Penix to find room. Ty Freifogel reminds me of David Bell. I've been saying that for the last two weeks, not just because they wear the same number, but I think just from a, a athletic standpoint, they've got great hands. I mean, obviously you can give us more insight on Freifogel, but he is one of the more impressive wide receivers in not only the Big Ten and in the country, and there's no doubt about that. So that I just think it's intriguing on both ends. And, of course, then it comes into the question the, the health of, of Michael Penix. Is he healthy to a point where he's going to be able to scramble um, you know, I always worry with a guy with a, a coming off an ACL, whether he's a quarterback or not, his ability to move. So, uh, no, I think that if I was to p- pick one position battle, it would be defensive back versus quarterback. Yeah, I think that Indiana is so solid there. Not not that Iowa is not good because they are. I know they've been very good over the last couple of years, but Indiana is is like I said, they're they're not just solid; they're deep. Uh, they're deep and interchangeable. Uh, I don't see. Indiana having problems giving up uh, yardage uh, in chunks, uh, scores. I I think that's going to be important because Indiana is going to now, other than that, they're going to have to rely on their front. Last year they were pretty – pretty good in the sacks department. And if they can do that as well, then that's good. That's a good day for your defense, but that's asking a lot. You're going up against a very good, well-coached team uh, that has a ton of talent on it uh, that always has great tight ends. Um, And, but I was, is going to have to rely on their running game. And I don't know if they can slow Indiana down Uh, this offense. I, I've seen them in practice, but they limited what we can see. Uh, and sure. you know, they protect Michael Penix. You know, he hasn't been hit. He still hasn't been hit. The first time he's going to be hit is when you see him get hit uh, this Saturday. Um, and I'm not concerned about his health. I, I have zero concern about him being healthy. I mean, um, him staying healthy. That's that's you know that's that's the the million dollar question there. And but we I started off earlier talking about he's put on bulk. He's de- definitively looks much bigger, stronger. I was like, Ooh, I was taking it back. He was a skinny guy last year. He was. Yes. And, and uh, Lamar Jackson is the only guy I've seen that can get away with that. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's a one in a million, man. He's a snake. He, he doesn't take the hits. He, he just never has. He didn't. I didn't see him in high school, but I saw him at Louisville. He just didn't get hit. It's like, boy, he just, it just didn't happen. And it's like, wow. But, Unfortunately, and it doesn't always have to be a hit, uh, as we've seen uh, with with this recent one with Michael Penix. But um, hopefully, with uh, medicine getting better, that everything is not there's not going to be an issue there. Uh, other than that, he looks incredible, and 
his arm, that's the one thing about him. He's always just had this unique laser type arm. It, it comes out like a, a rocket and just, so he, he just, once he gets comfortable, I remember two years ago at Michigan state, he threw for 20 straight completions. He was just short of the record and actually would have had the record. I think if it hadn't have been for a penalty uh, that got called in the end zone, but he, cause he ended up throwing a, a touchdown right after that, I think, but he didn't get the record, but that was two years ago and he was still learning. Um, and he's gone through a lot of hardship and learned. And Tom Allen has done a great job of bringing different coaches in when, when they've had to replace people that even though it's not been Michael's position coach, uh, Delon McCullough adds a lot to any team. You just came from a Super Bowl winning franchise, uh, two years removed from winning a Super Bowl with a Patrick Mahomes and company that you were around, that you were able to study, coach, to you know, be a part of that. There's just – that's gold right there. I mean, you're just bringing gold into the program. And a gold nugget that I just picked out of what you, you just got done talking about, Jim, was – the pass rush of Indiana against Iowa's offensive line. Let's remember, if you're an Iowa fan listening, that there's a good chance Iowa starts two brand new tackles in this game. Um, Jack Plum is listed as the starting left tackle on the most recent depth chart, but I'm hearing more and more, Mark, that Mason Richmond will start at left tackle. That may not happen. Um, Mason's a young guy. A lot of hype around this young man. I, I don't remember hype around a young guy like this since probably James Daniels as far as an offensive lineman who of course now is a starter for the Chicago Bears um so a lot of hype around this kid but he's never taken a snap in college and right now you've got Nick DeYoung starting at right tackle for Iowa so pass rush could be interesting the good news for Iowa we've seen Iowa break down in pass protection from the interior of the line at least uh, I, I think back to 2019 I'm extremely gun shy about 2019 the likes of Michigan and Penn State just killing Iowa up the middle over and over again. So now it's going to be a bit different. But another thing for Iowa fans to remember and, and for Indiana fans to realize is that Petrus is a, he's not, they may have the, the same first letter, their last name, but they are totally different style quarterbacks. Petrus is a statue and there's no question that's not changing. He is a statue in the pocket. So uh, the good news is if pass protection breaks down, as any offensive line guru knows, if pass protection breaks down, uh, from the outside, then he's able to step forward in the pocket, and make a throw. If it breaks down up the middle, you're done. So that may actually help Spencer a bit get settled. If, if the inside of his line, of course, anchored by Tyler Linderbaum at center, I think the best player maybe in, well, one of the best players in the country, definitely the best player in the big 10, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I think pass protection, that's going to be an excellent, uh, an excellent storyline to follow as well, Mark.